Thank you for being here as well. So um, just a, a, a few words. Um, this event is the last installment in a series that I have been curating here at the studio for the last couple of years under the moniker Contemporary Performance Practices, um, which is what it has been. And so um, I really just wanted to start by uh, with like a huge, huge transmission of gratitude to everybody here at the studio. So Nika, Harrison, Bill, Linda, Fee, and everybody else whose names I'm not mentioning. Um, thank you so much for making this possible with funding, space, food, resources, equipment, love, and everything else. It really, this work would not have been possible without you. So a huge round of applause, please, for everybody at the studio. Thank you so much. <laughs> But to, to bring this back to today, so um, today's event is centered around the work of the Greek artist Dimitris Papayuanu, who is a visual artist, director, choreographer, and really I kind of think of him as a wizard. Um, for me, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of knowing his work for about 20 years. It all started in 2004 with the um, opening ceremony of the Olympics in Athens, Greece where just to sort of give you a quick introduction, my students have heard me talk about this a million times, so I'm just going to make it quick. So imagine an Olympic stadium, open air, filled with water, and what looks like a conveyor belt with like a ginormous procession of hundreds of performers doing these tableau vivants of kind of walking you through the entire history of humankind. And then, um, the moment when I when I really kind of started to flip out was when this giant cube somehow floated out of the water and started hovering midair, and it was joined by this beautiful lithe figure with wings who was gently perching the sides of the cube and was like rotating in air. And I was like, oh, "Okay, what is going on here?" How, how are they doing this? I don't see any wires or cables or anything. And more than anything else, who is responsible for making this happen? So, you know, some Googling later, you know, I discovered the name of Dimitris Papayanu. And really for, for many, many years, I had what I felt like was a kind of long distance love affair with his work because his work was not being presented in the United States like ever until in 2017, um, a dear colleague and a visionary curator, Christy Edmonds, had the je ne sais quoi to invite his production of The Great Tamer, which we are going to watch today to the um, Center of Art for Performance at UCLA. So needless to say, I got my ass on the plane and went there to see the work. So I'm super happy that we are sharing this with you today. Um, just a few um, words of context. The uh, shot is, it's a wide shot. So you're basically kind of seeing the entirety of the stage uh, for the whole time. Dimitris wanted it that way just because his work is very painterly and it was very important for him, for the audience to kind of see the whole picture um, at whole time. Uh, content advisory, there is a lot of nudity, just a heads up. Um, and what else? So yeah, so we're going to watch the show. It's about an hour and 40 minutes. We're going to take a quick break, and then Dimitris is going to join us on Zoom for questions. We are going to have a panel with the John Wells Directing Fellows from the John Wells Directing um, Program here at the School of Drama. Uh, and we are also going to be joined by my dear colleague, Erica Lata, who's going to introduce herself. Do you see me? <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm an assistant professor of theater performance here at the uh, School for Contemporary Arts at Simon Fraser University. And I'm calling from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And my students are also. Thank you. Yeah, so we are uh, partnering with the Simon Fraser University uh, on this event. Uh, I also want to thank the John Wells Directing Program and everybody at the School of Drama. This um, event is part of our MFA Directing Lab class. And with that being said, let's watch the show. Great, um, let's get started. Well, first of all, let's please give a warm welcome to Dimitris. Hello. Thank you for joining us. 
Um, Thank you for I, watching it. <laughs> of course, that was great. Thank you so much for, for sharing the work with us. Um, so I um, am going to kind of get the conversation started with a couple of questions, um, just um, starting about your work in general. And I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about your artistic journey, kind of beginning in the visual arts and how you found your way into the realm of live performance. Well, uh, I, I started with painting, um, not exactly visual arts, but a traditional painter. I was a kind of a child prodigy in painting and my teachers encouraged me. And um, I actually ran away from home in order to become a painter when I was 18 years old. And I, I, I became the student of, of, uh, of a great Greek artist, a painter called, uh, called Yanis Tsaroukis, who was also one of the greatest set designers of uh, uh, contemporary Athens back then. And then, I, and then I studied in the School of Fine Arts. And while I was studying painting in the School of Fine Arts, um, needing a, a more direct connection with my contemporaries, I started designing comics, graphic novels. And uh, I started publishing in fanzine and underground comics magazines and, and getting um, a wider and wider dialogue with my, um, my generation. And uh, this was my first attempt for uh, to create a kind of storytelling through images. And then uh, when I was 19, I met a woman who was a, a, a teacher of contemporary dance and a choreographer. And she invited me to her classes for free. And once I entered, I never stopped. And I was drawn, I was drawn into this world of contemporary dance that was completely new for me. And soon she, 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 um, she allowed me to design sets and costumes and lights and makeup and to perform in her shows. And I got more and more charmed. And then at the age of 22, I decided to create my own stories. And uh, in an illegal building, in a squat, we squatted a building in the center of Athens and we transformed it into a small theater. And that's where I started uh, creating my first works. And then it went on and on and it absorbed me like uh, uh, becoming the, the, the basic vehicle of my expression. Um, painting on stage, in a way, telling stories on stage and not on canvases. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to give it to The Great Tamer, which is the work that we just um, watched just now. And I um, was very inspired by the conversation, the very first conversation we had about this work um, when you shared the sort of the seed or the inkling, um, an event that served as a kind of uh, starting point for your thinking about The Great Tamer. And I was wondering if you could share that story with the audience as well. Well, I, I was, I was in, in Azerbaijan, Baku, designing the opening ceremony of the first ever uh, European Games. And uh, following uh, the social media, Facebook back then. Um, I saw an image of a, a photograph of a young boy that was missing, a very charming portrait. And I kind of immediately, it immediately got my, my attention and I shared it also. Um, this boy had disappeared. He was like eight, 17 or 18 years old. And uh, then I got hooked in following that story and it ended up that we discovered this, this boy by a river, dead, and then the story came up that he had been uh, repetitively bullied by his friends, not enemies, by his friends, and uh, there, there, there were rumors that this was a murder or uh, this was a, 
um, a forced forced suicide. And and th there was a way that I was I was uh, I was moved deeply by this story, and I was also moved about the way that uh, society fell in love with this missing boy and was looking for it. And I was also moved by the fact that the, the people that were bullying him were his actual friends and his company in his university in this city of Athens, AOL of Greece. And all, all these, all these um, ideas about uh, about you know wanting something and also at the same time wanting to destroy it and wanted wanting to devour it and then want it again all all this um all these strange um emotions became the the raw material uh the emotional raw material as I was doing the show. But this doesn't mean, th this is not about this story. This is triggered from this story and it's about the emotions, the mixed emotions that I uh, were created inside me from this story and how they touch upon major issues about life itself, human life itself that concern me. Thank you, beautiful. Um, I'm going to pass the mic on to the fellows and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves first before they, they ask the question. And also just a quick reminder to all of the folks who are following us on Zoom, if you have questions, please, please feel free to type them in the comments and we'll try to get to at least some of them. Hi. It's so wonderful Hello. to meet you. Thanks for being here with us. My name's Hello. Jasmine. I'm one of the second year MFA, MFA fellows here at CMU. Hello, my name is Tatiana. I'm a first year MFA director. Hello. Hello, I am Carlo. I'm the other first year MFA director. Hello, Carlo. Oh, sure. Uh, Heidi Mitches. Uh, I have, I'm really interested in the way you use architecture and all its different definitions in The Great Tamer. For example, the breaking apart of the scenic design and also the breaking apart of the human body. So can you talk more about uh, what caught your interest in exploring these architectural elements regarding the human anatomy and physical structures? Uh, well, working with a human body as a main as a main uh, vehicle of expression, uh, the, the way the body looks and the way the body uh, moves, not using speech. Um, I explore um, as as we are improvising. I explore possibilities of distorting and and. Uh, uh, creating illusions uh, fr from the known that um, are believable and they kind of like all illusions they kind of open the door to the unknown to to, the, to, to what, what is hidden or what is in our fantasies so the this ridiculous game of, of creating optical illusions by combining bodies and and uh, I, I had explored in uh, primal matter for the first time and then I went on in still life and in the great tamer I, I I kind of I thought I had exhausted it but then at two more uh, two more shows I we discovered even more and more combinations in the in 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 Z and in transverse orientation we we have some new combinations um they they just give me um, uh, it, it is a lot of they, they give us a lot of pleasure discovering uh, new um, ways to trick the mind, to trick the eye and the mind. And uh, wh when we discover them, there are some of them are useful in in the storytelling in the in, in the storytelling of the show, and we put them in. In this per particular story, of course, the. 
find a way that is not very kitsch and very cheap to to kind of represent bullying or what it is to 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 be um to receive violence from your peers was 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 a, a more difficult task than to create those illusions of uh, unified uh, uh, hybrid bodies. That's why I ended up referencing um, um, uh, Rembrandt and the anatomy lesson and turning it into a cannibalistic feast. It was the only way that I found entertaining enough to talk about something that is not entertaining at all. Uh, in, in terms of breaking the set and, and breaking also the perception of the set of, of the set of the of the set, creating a wall that collapses and the, the suspense of something that's lying underneath and a surface that is um, dangerous and it can it, it, it has to do with the with, with, with a permanent as well notion I have that it's very interesting to destroy things on stage because uh, a live show is something that has been rehearsed and and uh, it's going to be repeated in the next night and and then audiences know that they know that they have the ticket of the first or the second night the um, the sense of distraction in front of your eyes uh, creates a uniqueness of the night that you are there. And this is something that interests me very much. Uh, but distorting space is part of a general uh, attempt to use our perception and our uh, and identifiable materials in order to twist and destroy our perception um, with the hope that we enter uh, together with the audience uh, um, a, a space of um, where imagination is heightened and things uh, become interesting and we start talking and meditating about our perceptions of life. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm curious. Um because the scenic design, those sheets in particular, seem so integrated and integral to the illusions you're speaking of and the action of the piece. I'm curious, in your process, do you design before you start building the piece? Do you design as you're building the piece with performers? What is sort of that process like for you? I need, I need, I need to design, to, to, to take the basic decisions about space um earlier than halfway because usually i design um i i, I use spaces where people they challenge the performers so i i need to have them uh in advance so uh in the case of the great tamer um the whole piece I, if i remember correctly was prepared in four months in around two months i had taken the decision that it's going to be a distorted floor and we experimented with some stuff. I created a mock-up one-to-one um, -one, um, set to start playing. And then with my set designer, we played on possibilities. And pretty much, we, we, we kept the first design. So early on, because I do need to understand what's happening with under and over and uh, um, I have to work with objects and uh, and and the basic space halfway uh, the latest. I have one more question. Um, I was very struck in the piece by simultaneity, the way it almost makes me feel like I was watching a tableau painting. And I was curious, when you're building these stage pictures, are you imagining, are you conceiving of the whole tableau at once, or do you build one, you know, one piece at a time or a certain focal point that then grows 
from that focal point? There is no plan when I'm composing. There are elements that I have selected as interesting from the um, from the workshop that we have encouraged, and and I I am um, the, the the methodology is like making a, a mosaic out of particles without knowing what the final image is, or making a creating a puzzle without knowing exactly what you're creating. So sometimes I. Um, I just place elements in space and then I move them around and then I tweak them a little bit in terms of timing and then the um, what you call tableau and I call uh, a scene is uh, appearing and it kind of makes sense even though it's not very connected that this woman with the two legs of the two men is together with two astronauts and somebody on it, even though it doesn't really make sense in terms of storytelling, it, it kind of, of makes sense in, in terms of how our mind is tripping as we're watching, or at least what I think about that, because of course I take full responsibility for all the uh, you know wonders or bullshit that are happening on stage. And um, I never preconceive them. There are some things that I have preconceived. Uh, that survive in the show, uh, like the astronaut with a um, with a face of loading. I don't know if that was at all at all uh, visible in in your screens, but behind his mask, there's there's a permanently computer loading uh, face, and and the um, symbol, not face, graphic, and 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 the fact that there there is going to be a, a pieta that there's going to be a nude body in the hands of an astronaut. So that the total covering and the total exposure of skin together in, in, an, in an image that is kind of religious, this was preconceived before I even start the, the show. Um, so it's a mixture of both, but mainly I don't know what I'm doing as I'm composing it. And when it feels right after many experiments, I keep it for a, for, for a for an amount of rehearsals, and if I am not uh, sick of it, I keep it until it survives the show. Thank you. This is continuing on kind of what we're already talking about with exploring things with performers and what you're saying about what's kind of pre preconceived versus what's discoveries. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more specifically about how you approach uh, collaborating with, with performers in that way. And uh, if you have certain exercises or things that you like to use as prompts or ways of structuring that kind of exploration and experimentation, or if it's really just dependent on, you know, what your what the material is demanding. I, well, there isn't material that's demanding anything. There is just a hint of an, a hint of ideas in my head. And if materials takes us uh, elsewhere that is more interesting, I'm always glad to go. Generally, I'm always happy to go to a, to a more interesting place than mm. what I think uh, would be worth exploring. So I just out of out of uh, uh, professionalism. I come. I come to the studio with some ideas. But the way that I so so, so that to, to kick off to, to to start the procedure and 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 to help people feel good, start laughing, start being creative, and start going crazy with 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 uh, with the materials I throw on them and the ideas that I I throw on them and the ideas that I throw them I throw back at them because I took from their first in, improvs. Mm. So. I, I I do come with some things when I gather people and I tell them, I want you to try this and I want us to play with that. But this is just to kick off an irrational uh, workshop. While selecting people, one of, one, one of, the, of, of the parameters, of course, is creativity. So in my auditions, there are, there are improvisations and, and people that are creative and inventive uh, are, um, are people that I am charmed with. Mm -hmm. So there, there is an interesting mixture of, of, of things that have been discovered purely in the workshops by, by the performers and have taken me to a complete uh, different 
uh, uh, direction that I, that I would go uh, gladly, and I gladly uh, went there, and, and, and some fixations of my mind that I want them to try and I want them to do the way I have conceived them. So there are some lifts in the Great Tamer. There are two lifts that I have invented. One is um, those, there are, there are two, two men that are walking parallel in the air. But this came completely out of my mind, not, not, no improvisation. I just figured out in my, in my mind that it could happen and I asked them to try it. And I had to insist a lot until they believe it's possible. And uh, the other one is uh, a lift between the legs. Somebody is flying, which is, again, something that I thought. So th these things do not come out of workshops. Other things, like how one woman is, is walking with two um, different men's legs, this was suggested to me. This was one, one, one result of, of um, a workshop or an imagination. So uh, it's, it's uh, I take full responsibility of collecting what I think is interesting and composing it. But the material does not come from me. I trigger um, um, the curiosity and, and the creativity of a group of very talented and creative people, and I throw them objects because my, my, my studio is a warehouse in a way. I, I keep th those flying sheets are leftovers from the previous work mm -hmm. and, and, and I never threw them away. And then we realized that they can bend, we realized what we can do, what sound they make, and they created the whole set. The idea of the set came from something that was there in the studio and we just hadn't thrown away. Thank you. That's, I love what you just said about triggering, triggering creativity, triggering the curiosity and throwing things at them. Um, I have one more question if that's okay. Um, I'm curious if there's right now in general, if there's other artists or throughout your life, other artists, theatrical or not, that you've taken inspiration from or that kind of nourish your soul or pique your curiosity? Well, my, my main influences come from other arts than performing arts, like uh, cinema and painting. And, um, but from, uh, um, fr from the performance art legends, I am between the two opposite poles of adoring the work of Bob Wilson and the work of Pina Baus. So the most the most non psychological, cold and architectural, irrational dream, con constructing irrational dreams is Robert Wilson, and then the, the hottest expressionistic and uh, um, human centered soul that changed the world of theater the last century is Pina Bausch, and and both both of those have uh, um, as an art lover. Uh, when when I encountered their creativity, my life was changed, mm. and uh, and these were big loves that lasted and were confirmed many times. So it's not like one work that I love, but it's like fifteen or twenty of Pina Baus that I have experienced and loved. So, but of course, then uh, there, there are there are um, there are. There's one work of 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 of, uh, of a guy uh, named Javier Leroy, one work that is called Self Unfinished that completely changed my life, uh, and also Gustavia by Larry Bo, and um, and of course um, seeing the work of Castellucci is a constant reminder of, of uh, that that it's worth it. It's it's worth it trying to to make things um, be at their best, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, because there are there are some artists that are really trying to, to make things be uh, really what they are, to 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 not not only to have an idea, but 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 to make this idea so clear and articulate, which is half the artistry. Uh, 
And you know, you know, and you see that success would be the same with much less. But nevertheless, they're going all the way. And this is, this is, uh, this is the only way, I think. And, and I'm very, of course, I'm, I'm grateful when I see them because they, they like the way. Thank you. Erica? Hi, Dimitri. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. Such beautiful work. I think I saw that production at BAM in Brooklyn uh, long ago. <laughs> um, what I find uh, so arresting about your work is each visual element and the performer's commitment to the source material uh, seems to, uh, I would say, pulse effortlessly through the performer's veins. And I just want to know, how do you guide the collective of artists um, uh, to create this sort of palpable unity on stage by 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 never stopping to correct being uh, focused on the best possible result and uh, getting on their nerves <laughs> yeah um, um, I'm, I'm famously very 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 few times satisfied and and rightly so uh, I, I i i do have the capacity to love them very much and i think they feel that but starting with myself, I never settle down if it's not uh, live, live, live shows are very are a very particular job. And I am present in every presentation and I I correct and, and fix my stupid things and their stupid things every every uh, day. You know, the very the very attempt to create hybrid bodies and, and to make uh, materials move or make sounds makes you um, uh, as a performer uh, acquire the humbleness of the puppeteer. You become a puppeteer of your own body and a puppeteer of elements and this kind of humbleness to actors and dancers um, is, is very useful um, because it, it, it kind of changes the ego, changes yeah. the the way that, and, and also in my work, they're also exposed. I mean, they are caressed by my lighting and my and my love for the human body and my adoration of beauty. Uh, but at the same time, they are completely exposed. And um, and also by repetition, I, I we really never stop working. So yeah. they, they they become fluent. It becomes like a second language to them. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like that that's, um, I mean, I have a sense or I feel that from the audience's perspective, that they have a sense of the whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that they are, they have their individual energy and, and rigor, and they also have the sense of the whole image. So that, that they can do like what Yoshi Oida says, they can sort of stand a little bit three inches out from their body and be able to control it because they mm -hmm. have both perspectives. Um, and I, I don't, I see that like from the work and, and that I'm always like, ah, <laughs> so uh, exciting. And I think what you said about creating, um, having people who are inventing um, in the room and that creativity of always being curious and working, would you say that you're, the people you gather have that general, you pick them for that curiosity? I, I over, over, over the years, I have managed many times to create, to, to, to collect people that are kind of adorable. <laughs> and and, and, and if, 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 they, if they are not ready with these work ethics and they are shocked about the, 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 the precision and the, and the amount of work that this takes, we, we, we kind of work so hard and so honestly together that, that it becomes a kind of an ideology that it, it's a joy of life to agree that we will do our best. And, and, and it's okay if we exhaust ourselves because there is a lot of joy produced through that. It's, it's a kind of, um, mm. it's a sense of dignity of a small group of people yeah. that are working to make sense of their lives. So, uh, mm. and, and, and this combined with touring the world and, and, and uh, having um, 
a sense of being successful is, is, it was very moving in those tours that we did with these shows. That we are, you know, we just done something and then we show it to the world and we never, and we never, um, we never trick the audiences. We, all, we are always at the, at the limit of our talents. We cannot go beyond our talents, but at least we can show you what the limit is. This is as good as we can do it for you. And this, this is um, very few people that I have selected, I have failed on that uh, respect, uh, on that uh, parameter. An exchange. I have sort of a technical question, but sort of speaking to that, um, as I love what you said that each performance has its own sort of makeup. And can you talk about how you adapt each work you make to a new venue, both in design and in performance? Well, I don't really, I don't really, because I do carry my own set and I, I design works that are happening on the set. And, uh, and I, I do have um, a specific light rigging uh, device. So there is an amount of, of flexibility that has to do with how deep the set is going to be or how when we get out of the set or in the surroundings of the set, how we're going to deal with the space. Is it going to be the easy solution of a black box or do we have an interesting architecture that we can expose around it? But nevertheless, in most of the, of the works, there is an island on which things are happening because I am unfortunately a control freak and I want what I have designed to be then redesigned and redesigned and redesigned. There are other people, of course, that are more creative with that, but I am stubborn in, in in, in having the same the same exact production. Yeah, adjusting maybe just because you're in a new space performance wise, um, like, you know, affects you, I imagine, uh, as a performer. Um, thank you. Performers, yeah. performers have to adjust the, the, their projection, as we say many times, because sometimes the theaters are have a high gradient, sometimes they are um, traditional baroque stages, and depending where, where the people and how high the people are, they have to somehow adjust. Um, th this, this, this is a big adjustment, but it's also a very subtle one. It's a very important one, but a very subtle one, and it's a little bit personal. And it's kind of easy. We just, we have some tricks to, to open up or close up. But in terms of Adjusting the set, no, it's there. And, and so on these square meters, they know exactly where to go and how to navigate because they've been doing it for two years or something. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, such a pleasure to see your work and talk with you today. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. And I would like to start with somebody who submitted it on Zoom. So, Monsi, hello, Monsi from Vancouver, um, says, hi, Dimitris. Uh, thank you so much for being with us all today. Could you talk about the types of language you use while directing actors to get the performances you want or to invite them into your worlds? And how has that language evolved over your careers since the, your beginnings as a painter? Well, I, I, I'm... I'm trying to be very practical and very uh, precise from outside the stage. Halfway, I, I, I move myself outside and I take a microphone so I become the authority voice, so I have to make jokes and I have to be very clear <laughs> which foot, which size, where to, uh, guiding people. So I, 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 have, I have developed a way of, of, of being able sometimes to be very clear as a GPS uh, guide. Uh, <laughs> I, I, after, after I compose, then, then, then I talk about things that have to do with, um, with atmospheres and with the musicality of energies and with, with the change of timings and very rarely about emotions. I, I don't like, I don't like, um, performers to be encouraged to 
um, uh, go through emotions on stage. I, I, I talk about emotions that what we are doing is triggering to the audience maybe on a later stage when I also understand what I'm doing and I understand what I'm feeling as I am watching it. Uh, I like my fellow citizens to feel as well. So I, I then transform my way of explaining things into a kind of more artistic or poetic language, which I completely hate in the beginning uh, of making it. And, uh, and of course, I can mock myself a lot about um, th th these things. Um, nevertheless, uh, they are true. I mean, they are, they are true parameters of, of projection and um, uh, of, of how, how a scene could work or but nevertheless, I am extremely, mostly I am extremely practical and technical, and I also try to be funny. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody here at the studio have questions? Yes, would you like to come? And uh, the camera is right there. There's a few more in the chat, just to know, Yvonne. Yes, yes, I see them. Um, I just want to ask, I see that during the whole show, there are a lot of like, flipping gestures happening on stage and especially in the first parts like um the actors are covering a cloth and taking it away um i want to know why do actors just do not just take it away but by blowing it away flipping it i just curious why do we choose that action of flipping the board and uh, yes because it is like uh, creating uh, an act of puppeteering on the on the fabric itself. It's like, and also it's like a, uh, an action that has a um, um, has effect on another action, and those two actions do not connect, mm -hmm. but simply by one creating something else, uh, creating the uh, the result of the other action without connecting themselves uh, directly it's a kind of puppeteering of um, um of the forces of um nature or the, the laws of nature um, uh, about gravity and lightness and gravity and lightness is exactly the two uh, basic elements that drive the whole show and it ends with a skeleton giving up to gravity and the, and the silver piece of paper with a human breath going to, um, towards lightness. So this stake that happens, um, th th this, this issue that is opened up in the beginning, in terms of lightness, I didn't want an immediate human action. In terms of gravity, I wanted an, an immediate human action. So that's that is why. Thank you. It's very inspiring. Thank you. There are a few more questions in the chat. Um, some are similar, so I'm going to pick one that I feel like kind of combines um, the similar inquiry. Um, Will. Um, is asking, I wanted to ask, what do you feel are the differences and connecting factors between the time-based nature of performing arts and the traditionally non-temporal nature of painting, especially when it comes to the repetitions of scenes and images over time? I'm not sure I, I completely understand the question. Can I, can I hear it once more? Sure. Uh, what are the differences and connecting factors between the time-based nature of performing arts and the traditionally non-temporal nature of painting, especially when it comes to the repetition of scenes and images over time? Oh, okay, okay, yes. It's a completely different, uh, completely different medium. The only thing that is connected is the sense of composition. Composition in time, which is in a way composition in space, um, is of a different color and has completely different parameters than, compo than composition uh, of a visual art or on a canvas. Nevertheless, 
the sense of composition, the laws of composition, the possibilities and the methodology of the brain and imagination to compose is exactly the same. And um, I think this is the only, only, uh, the only similarity, which is of course an elemental uh, basic uh, similarity. The, the differences are of course that in, in painting, I am alone and in theater, I am in a chaotic constant <laughs> attempt to communicate with other people this is this is another <laughs> this is another universe not even another continent this is a, a great difference and of course I, I i only know how to look at things as a painter and uh, that that was my training that is my nature and that is the, that is that is the cry that is the mind i use when i create theater but theater is about time it's not about the images. And unfortunately, when dealing with my work, uh, people talk about images and talk about tableaus as, as all I'm interested in is morphing. How do things morph in front of your eyes and what tricks can I play? How fast, slow, hidden or, or obvious the morphing of things from one to another is happening. This is the dance I'm doing for, according to my, uh, um, uh, idea. Um, so it's not about the composition of images, it's about the way that images transform in front of your eyes. And this is very different from um, the work of a painter. This is a completely different uh, idea to play with. Thank you. Um, there's a question that sort of segues from what you just said. Um, Savannah wants to know, are there any scene or picture building or layering techniques that you learned as a painter that you transferred to the performance world and, um, and now use to build the scenes and the set? Not, not really, not really. The only, the only thing that is really, really important is how I see. So when I see my 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 great teacher Yanis Tsaroukis told me that once you start to see as a painter to see to look at things as a, as painters do um, you never it never goes away and also it's very difficult to explain to people that do not see like that what that means I guess this kind of loneliness have musicians as well there is a kind of musicians that have the perfect pitch ear and and. The way that they hear that cars passing is very different from what we hear. So I guess this is this is the the, the biggest connection. I cannot get rid of, 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 of this thing. And that's what I use to apply my personal taste on things on theater. This is this is the tool I use, the tool in my brain, I mean, that I use to select things because what what seems interesting and what not. Is my responsibility, uh, and this is why I signed the work that I show to you because I, I I select what I believe and hope that is interesting from from our creative process, and this this is the tool that I um, uh, I selected with uh, by looking at it as as. I look at things every day as a, as a painter, as a trained traditional painter. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have time for one more. Please come. Um, hi, Divitris. Um, first of all, um, thank you so much for um, having this meeting and um, we get to have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, so um, to introduce myself, my name is Chishing. I study video and media design in um, Carnegie Mellon School of Drama. So it's um, basically um, projections in the theater. So it's relatively a new media that um, um, comparing to uh, scenic and, and lighting design in theater. So it's more used in a concert and other events. But yes. we... Yeah, we are trying to um, consider the media design um, 
not less of a uh, addition to the scenery, but more of a um, a uh, how to say a um, the the uh, another dimension of the uh, theater re reality and like a uh, uh, dramaturgically um, character for the for the show. So yes. um, and, and in your work. Um, I, I, I know that you use a lot of um, very physical um, human body and um, you emphasize on the liveness. So you, you do also um, create imagery um, on that screen. You use the life shadow and um, the reflection of water um, in the Great Hammer and the um, Transverse Orient Oriental. So um, I'm curious about what, what this projection and, and media for you um, in your, um, if there's any in, in your uh, future um, design or not at all. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I also like to be low tech. I very much like low tech imagination because I do come from a, from a generation where we still remember handcraft. And, and I still do it. I mean, I mean, I, I take my hands and I create something with my hands. And this is an art that is being lost. And I, I, I like to be a bit nostalgic about it. And I very much like to create uh, 3D or uh, new age illusions with very humble and uh, low tech materials. This is a kind of, um, how can you say, kind of game that I do that I'm, I, I, I very much like to demonstrate that the imagine the human imagination is the the, the most complicated um, um, device of creating uh, images. In terms of uh, projections, I I I have used them only in the in the in the huge events that I've done, the Olympics and the um, and and the. The opening ceremony of the Summer Olympics of Athens and the, and the opening ceremony of, of the first European Games. And I, I, I used some projections, not very, uh, not, not a lot, um, because again, I wanted to stress the, the importance of really creating something, like really creating a mountain on stage and not the impression of a mountain on, on, on stage. So as, as, as I see, um, the, um, the new technologies um, expanding into set design and to show business, I, I become a bit more nostalgic about low tech and, and about how more effective can I be? How can I really flip the mind with a simple piece of wood? Um, so I am a little bit suspicious uh, about the illusions that are made from projections. But having said that, I completely admire the way um, the minds and the technologies evolve in, in projection mapping and in light designing. And I am waiting for the moment that new inventions will happen. And after they have been exhausted in all the pop shows, I can take them and use them a little bit differently. Um, and huh. I'm waiting until they're vintage a little bit, so that I so, so that I can I can get them and maybe create something um, with them that is uh, very effective, but in a, in a kind of a minimal way. I um, but also I have not met an artist that uses them in a way that I would very much like to uh, collaborate with. When when this happens, I will be all for it. Like wow, one thousand percent. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you, Shishen. Thank you, Dimitris. Thank you so much. Please shout out to Dimitris Papayoano. Thank you. You don't um, understand. I feel I feel I feel awkward that you saw it from this medium. I it know. is unedited, and, and this is not how it's meant to be. So silence and slow motion and optical illusions are very different when they are in three dimension uh, in, in front of your eyes. 
and and um, there, there are time time passes differently when when you you have committed to the ceremony of sitting down and watching a, a live uh, show. So what you saw was you were informed about what I did, but you didn't see what what I have done because this only happens in a live theater or in an edited version of the show. But nevertheless, thank you for your patience and your interest. And well, speaking speaking of live. I hope to see you in Montreal next okay. month. Okay. And, <laughs> and all of you Canadians on Zoom, you know, mark my words, March 1st to the 4th, you can see Dimitris' piece in Montreal. And um, if any of you want to come along, I'm going to be there. Okay. So, come and yeah. say hi. Yes, I will. Bye Thank bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. bye.